Uh, well, welcome to the Institute. I'm Gary Hoffbauer. Adam Posen is uh, traveling. Let me say a word first about Canada and then a word about uh, Minister Fast and we'll, we'll get going. As everyone here knows, Canada is, is the U.S. largest trading partner. But I want to touch on a few other points. Uh, one near and dear to my heart is their federal corporate tax rate is only 16 percent and the all-in tax rate is just 25 percent on corporate 24 percent on corporations compared to our 39 percent their banks didn't need a stress test they're not engaged in currency wars <laughs> Canada came through the the Great Recession with only a very mild hiccup, hiccup and uh, turning more closely to uh, say bilateral issues we always have since our trade relation is so deep we always have a, a rich roster of bilateral issues there's the keystone of course uh, lumber wars never end thank uh, for which k street is very happy and um, now we have the lng export issue not so much a concern to canada but maybe indirectly a concern to canada um, Turning very quickly to the uh, to the trade uh, agenda, as people here know, uh, Canada's joined the Trade Pacific Partnership talks. It looks like Japan will be joining at the end of the week. But probably less well known in Washington is that Canada and the minister in particular are getting close. I was told yesterday with a informed Canadian. Very, getting very close to a path-breaking agreement with the European Union, which has a lot of precedence, which may be interesting in the TPP uh, context. Now, turning uh, very briefly to the minister, Minister Ed Fast, he's been given the title, not a Minister of International Trade, but Minister for the Asia-Pacific Gateway. He comes from British Columbia, which is not known as a conservative stronghold, but I guess he's an exception to the to the general flavor of British Columbia. And uh, he's a lawyer, uh, practiced commercial law for many years, and he has uh, the portfolio, which includes all the issues I've talked about, uh, and 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 others as well. Um, <clears throat> let me. Um, pay special attention to the fact that Fred Bergson is back. Uh, he, he has uh, returned from his vacation in uh, Florida, uh, and uh, as, as everyone knows, he's our director emeritus. And just to make sure he hasn't completely gone to seed in Florida, I'm going to ask him to uh, throw the first question at the minister after the, after the death. Minister makes a presentation. Uh, Minister, I want to warn you that there are an awful lot of Sharpies in the room from the press and trade uh, trade experts, so you can expect some searching questions. So we'll, we'll go on maybe for 30 minutes or so, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have the question period. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you and to, to reacquaint myself with some of you, uh, having met you before. Um, and thank you to the Peterson Institute for the kind invitation to join you today. It's an honor and indeed a privilege to address such an august group of economic leaders. And I do feel myself uh, a little bit out of my, my own element, uh, being in the midst of uh, economic professionals, economists who really understand this stuff. I'm a simple trade minister. <laughs> you know, I try to open up doors for Canadian businesses uh, around the world. Uh, but of course, uh, we're also in the investment attraction business, which is also one of the reasons that I was in New York the last couple of days and I'm, I'm here in Washington today. And it is great to be back in Washington, D.C. As Canada's Minister of International Trade, my work does take me all around the world to many different places. Of course, I love meeting with fellow free traders, but by far my most frequent visits are to your country and indeed to Washington, D.C. Uh, and I am disappointed that my counterpart, Ron Kirk, is uh, moving on. Um, 
I must say, Ron and I had a very open, we had a very honest, sometimes very frank, but in the end, always eminently productive relationship. And together with all of our key stakeholders, we were able to move the Canada-US relationship forward uh, in a way I think that really serves the interests of our citizens well. And I certainly have wished him well as he enters uh, a new season of life. There's all kinds of rumors floating around about his future, and uh, I certainly wish him well. You know, there is much that our countries share. Uh, the Canada-US relationship is a model for the rest of the world. It is founded on our common values of freedom, uh, democracy, the defense of human rights at home and abroad, and of course, um, the, the rule of law. And we share a deep commitment to free markets and more open trade. In fact, on most issues uh, it, on the international stage when it comes to trade, Canada and U.S. Sh share common views. Um, no other two nations have ties as close as ours. Quoting one of your former presidents, quote, geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, economics has made us partners. That was, of course, President Kennedy during an address to our parliament in 1961. His words are as true today as they were over a half a century ago. Canada and the U.S. are still each other's best neighbor, friend, and customer. And regarding customer, uh, there is indeed no stronger or more trusted trade relationship between any two nations on earth. As you know, this past January 2nd marked the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. The agreement positioned our two countries as the vanguard of trade liberalization. It stood as a shining example to the world of just what can be achieved when barriers to trade are reduced and eliminated. But as any good student of North American economic history will tell you, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was only the beginning. Its successor, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which also brought Mexico into the fold, was destined to become the single most successful economic arrangement the world has ever known. Canada and the U.S. now share the largest bilateral flow of goods, services, people, capital and investment between any two countries in the world. In 2012, our two-way trade in goods and services exceeded $742 billion. That's nearly $2 billion a day, or almost $1.4 million crossing our border every minute. And these numbers aren't simply sterile statistics. Those of you who are economists, of course, are used to statistics. Um, I did take a statistics course in university some 40 years ago. Uh, I didn't like it, I must tell you. Um, but those statistics that I've just quoted, they represent jobs, very real jobs, some 2.4 million of them in Canada and 8 million in, in the United States. In other words, the Canada-US trade relationship drives over 10.5 million jobs. But the face of international trade has changed over the last 25 years. You may recall that NAFTA was a first-generation free trade agreement, one that was primarily focused on the removal of uh, tariff barriers. Today, traders must grapple with many non-tariff barriers, such as duplicative reporting requirements, misaligned standards and regulatory impediments, special licenses, bureaucratic customs delays at the border, the need to apply for trusted tra trader and traveler programs twice, and of course, the list goes on. And there are areas such as the services trade, things such as environmental goods, government procurement, and the digital economy face restrictions which first generation trade agreements never accounted for. And that's why more recently, Prime Minister Harper and President Obama committed to re energizing the Canada US partnership by implementing two complementary initiatives the Beyond the Border Action Plan and the Regulatory Cooperation Council. So far, real progress has been made to speed up legitimate trade and travel, improve and move security to the perimeter of our two countries, align regulatory approaches where appropriate, and make it easier for companies in both of our countries to do business with each other. Taken together, these two initiatives represent the most significant boost to North American competitiveness and cooperation 
since NAFTA. And I'm going to digress for a moment. Uh, the threat of sequestration, in fact, it's, it's a very real threat here uh, in the United States, also has a very significant impact on Canada and, of course, the rest of the world. And one of the concerns that I would express is that if sequestration is not uh, addressed very soon, that we will see significant withdrawal of resources at our borders that would uh, <laughs> um, reinstate some of the uh, very clear barriers that still exist at the border. And uh, both the uh, Beyond the Border Vision Initiative as well as the Regulatory Cooperation Initiative were very significant efforts at removing the barriers that we have at our border. And so I just throw out that note of caution. Uh, the, uh, the impacts of sequestration uh, could and likely will be felt far beyond uh, the American border. But to be fair, we still have a long way uh, to go in bringing those two initiatives uh, to fruition. Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, and, and your administration to ensure that the current momentum is not lost. I would really covet your support in that effort. We want to make sure that as we continue to push to implement uh, these uh, various initiatives, there's about, uh, I believe there's 31 under the Border Vision uh, package and there's about 29 initiatives under the Regulatory Cooperation package. And we're working very hard, certainly on the Canadian side, to move forward and actually implement. Uh, this is some of the low-hanging fruit we have in terms of uh, trade facilitation. Now, the border vision and regulatory cooperation pieces are initiatives that we can also leverage as our respective countries work shoulder to shoulder within the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Of course, the Peterson Institute has recently released a pair of studies on the TPP looking at the potential value and impacts in the context of other regional initiatives. These studies provide valuable insight and, I am told, have been of great interest to our negotiators at the negotiating table. I did receive a report back uh, two nights ago about progress being made at TPP. The negotiators have completed those talks uh, that round in Singapore and apparently they did go well. There's still many, many issues outstanding. We share the U.S.'s goal of uh, completing these negotiations by the end of this year. Um, that's quite a daunting task, I must, must tell you, because there's still so much to be done. And when you're talking about going beyond a bilateral agreement to a regional trade agreement with 11 partners, perhaps 12 partners at the table, that it's a real challenge trying to find consensus on all of the outstanding issues. Now, one of the studies that the Peterson Institute uh, conducted and prepared um, indi uh, indicated that the TPP is clearly a significant trade deal in the making and if done properly would lead to even bigger deals over time and given Japan's interest we can see how this agreement is starting to morph into something much mar more than it started off being. The TPP not only serves as a central pathway for economic integration in the Asia-Pacific, it is designed to, ex to be expanded to include others beyond Japan. Indeed, it is, it is hoped that the TPP will act as a catalyst to reinvigorate the moribund Doha round of the WTO. Once complete, the partnership will not only strengthen Canada's efforts to broaden and deepen its trading relationships within the Asia-Pacific region, it will also reaffirm and invigorate our traditional partnerships in the Americas, including that with the U.S. We are very pleased to be working shoulder to shoulder with you in forging new economic links with some of the fastest growing and most dynamic markets in the world. The high level of integration of the Canadian and American markets and our common North American production platform demand a shared approach to preserving and building upon our North American supply chains. Our, auto, uh, our automotive industry is a great example of Canada's U.S. supply chains in action. Canadian and American vehicles are built to service North American markets using common safety and environmental standards. One automotive part in a Canadian built vehicle will often cross the border as many as six or seven times before the final assembled car hits the road. In the TPP it will be our task as governments to promote the jobs and economic prosperity that are sustained by this vibrant and effective economic partnership. 
But I would also like to note that in today's modern economy, it's more than just about the movement of goods. Facilitating the movement of business people is just as important as ensuring the free movement of goods, capital, services, and of course investment. Major U.S. companies such as Microsoft, Warner Brothers, IBM, and Cisco have vocally and repeatedly told me that their businesses suffer when they can't get the people they need across the border. In our integrated Canada-U.S. economy, facilitating the temporary movement of business people between work locations supports the success of our businesses and spurs job creation. The TPP negotiations offer us a chance to optimize the rules for the easy movement of professionals and business people across our border. Truly, the TPP is a once-in-a-generation opportunity for our two countries to work together with our other partners to craft a gold standard 21st century trade agreement. Of course, everyone approaches negotiations with a view to protecting and promoting their interests. And Canada is no exception. The U.S. is no exception. But the difference with Canada and the U.S., as history has borne out, is that what is good for one is usually good for the other, which is why I feel compelled to say a few words about Buy Local or Buy American policies. As you are no doubt aware, Buy America has been a persistent irritant for, the, for Canadian industry. We oppose any restrictions which are counterproductive to our shared goal of restoring economic growth in North America. Modern economies need the flexibility to be able to adapt to rapidly advancing technology. Buy local policies, such as the Buy America restrictions included in the infrastructure bills that have recently been introduced in Congress, and of course in some of your state legislators, uh, le legislatures, those inhibit our ability to adapt to changing times. And I might note that uh, in our negotiations with the European Union, government procurement has played a very prominent role. It has been one of the EU's offensive interests. And um, we will likely see an outcome that will represent the most ambitious comprehensive uh, government procurement chapter ever closed. Um, and we've worked very hard with our uh, constituents, with our key stakeholders, including our provinces, our territories, and our municipalities to come up with a package that actually works for everybody. And as you probably know, we have uh, one benefit in Canada, that is our municipalities have no independent legal standing under our constitution. They are simply creatures of the provinces. Um, so we don't have to negotiate with every municipality, some 4,000 of them. Um, but at the same time, we have had a higher level of consultation with them than we've ever had in any of our free trade negotiations. So we see government procurement as being an area where we can really improve uh, value for our economies, efficiencies within our economies going forward. Just a few moments ago, I spoke of our highly integrated supply chains. Uh, just to reinforce the point, our economies are so integrated between the U.S. and Canada that every one dollar of Canadian exports to the U.S. contains 25 cents of American content. That's on average. Think about that. When we export products, typically they're going to contain 25% American content. I raise the highly integrated nature of our two economies only to highlight that determining what is American or Canadian is becoming increasingly difficult and arbitrary. Further, these types of restrictions upset efficient supply chains limit choice, and drive up contract administration costs for the purchasing organizations, including local governments, state governments, etc. For these reasons, many American industries and trade organizations themselves, from suppliers to government purchasers, have spoken out against the application of Buy America policies to Canada. What's more, the very idea that such policies save domestic jobs is theoretically flawed, I believe speaking as a non-economist. As you know, it is not a given that simply increasing imports automatically uh, reduces the overall number of jobs in a country. As history has shown, unemployment can change substantially over the course of business cycles. On average, however, the number of jobs will roughly be a constant proportion 
of the size of the working population. That is, provided the playing field is level, and I emphasize that, a level playing field. Job numbers should not be impacted measurably by a nation's openness to imports. This is especially so when those imports become critical intermediate inputs in the manufacture of products for exports, for export. For those of you not familiar with it, I would commend to you some excellent work done by the WTO and the OECD in recalibrating how we look at and evaluate imports and exports. By parsing out intermediate inputs, including services, uh, they have provided us with a much better understanding of the role that imports play in driving wealth creation in our respective economies. In short, I believe the old mercantilist math of exports good, imports bad is anachronistic. Indeed, what our goal should be is larger terms of trade. Instead of more bi-local policies, what we need are stronger rules on government procurement to ensure that level playing field that I referenced earlier, uh, to drive efficiency and c competitiveness and help protect the economic gains made through trade liberalization. So within the TPP, that might mean rules that further encourage the integration of supply chains across the TPP region. It might mean rules that enhance government's abilities to obtain best value for taxpayer money in their purchasing. And it may mean rules that provide secure access to opportunities created by the rapid development of public infrastructure throughout the Asia-Pacific region. Estimated for the Southeast Asian economies, ASEAN as they're called, for them alone, it's expected to be $60 billion of infrastructure a year. We believe that an ambitious 21st century TPP agreement can and should include such rules within a robust government procurement chapter. So through the TPP negotiations, we will continue to work with the U.S. to strengthen overall North American competitiveness, creating jobs, growth, and long-term prosperity for both of our countries. Moving now to another one of our mutual strengths, indeed one of the cornerstones of the Canada-U.S. economic partnership, and that is energy. Our two countries share the largest and most significant energy relationship in the world, reflecting our mutual commitment to energy security, economic prosperity, and environmental responsibility. Canada is the largest supplier of oil to the U.S. In 2011, delivering 2.8 million barrels a day of crude oil and refined products, more than Saudi Arabia and Venezuela combined. Nonetheless, we are on the brink of a fundamentally altered global supply-demand paradigm. To paraphrase another one of your presidents in his most recent State of the Union address, President Obama noted that the U.S. is buying less foreign oil than it has in 20 years and producing more domestically that it ha than it has in 15 years. Game changing, to be sure. But the truth of the matter, at least in the short to medium term, is that the U.S. will continue to be reliant upon imported oil. In fact, the U.S. Energy, Administra uh, uh, the US Energy Information Agency's annual energy outlook foresees the U.S. still importing 37% of its net oil requirements in 2040. What's more, until renewable energy technologies are perfected, widely available, and economically viable, the world will continue to rely on fossil fuels for the majority of its energy needs. And that's why Canada is working in lockstep with the U.S. on controlling greenhouse gas emissions. Unlike most other countries supplying the U.S. market, including Venezuela and Saudi Arabia, Canada has, in fact, committed to an emissions reduction target under the Copenhagen Accord that is aligned with the U.S. target, 17 percent below 2005 levels by the year 2020. And we're already halfway there in Canada. Canada is systematically implementing a sector-by-sector -sector regulatory approach to reduce emissions and meet our target. For example, in the transportation sector, we're regulating GHG emissions from heavy and light duty vehicles that align with American standards. And in the coal-fired electricity sector, we have just this past September released regulations to reduce emissions, which will make Canada the first country in the world 
to ban new coal plants that use traditional technology. Friends, there's no doubt that as America unlocks its own vast new supplies of domestic oil and gas, its reliance on imported oil will decrease. But in the meantime, the strategic value of Canada as a reliable, friendly, and environmentally responsible source of oil and gas to the United States cannot be understated, particularly in light of continuing instability in the Middle East and North Africa. And I put, the, I put the proposition to a number of your stakeholders yesterday where I said, you know, the United States does face a choice. It can continue to purchase its oil from countries like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and Nigeria, countries that do not share Canada's and the United States' values, that do not share our common goals and objectives relating to the environment, or the United States can purchase oil from its most trusted and longest standing trade partner. And uh, when you look at the merits of the case, when you actually look at the science of the case, clearly the Keystone XL project should be approved. Ladies and gentlemen, just as we were 25 years ago, Canada and the US once again stand together on the precipice of economic history through the beyond the border vision, the regulatory cooperation work we're doing, and the TPP, we're helping to write a new 21st century trade rule book. Through our shared commitment to energy security and environmental responsibility, we can and should show the world that its two most trusted and forward-looking trade partners continue to lead on economic growth and climate change. By reinforcing and building our strategic partnership, we're ensuring the prosperity and security of Canadians and Americans alike for many generations to come. So I look forward to joining you as we make that goal a reality. I also look forward to the comments uh, that you'll hear from the stage. Thank you very much.